Hey, welcome back, everyone. This is Chase. And uh, joining me today, it, for me, this is an especially fun conversation, uh, having Dr. Lejean Lawson on, um, a, an alumni of, of um, Utah State. Um, you, you studied at Utah State, got your master's in clothing and textiles, went on, got a PhD at, you know, in exercise and sports science at, at Oregon State, um, and then have had this fascinating career in um, in apparel design, and in particular, when it comes to to sports bras, um, you know, and and in particular, um, you know, your master's thesis focused on you know yes. really creating the modern sports bra that that we know today. Um, so this is a fun f- conversation for me for so many reasons. You're also a member of our advisory board uh, for the OPDD program. Um, you've just been such a great supporter of ours, and and. I'm surprised it took us so long to do something like this. Um, so I appreciate you taking some time. Absolutely. Um, the opportunity I had to do my master's work at Utah State University really created the whole foundation for what has been an amazing 37, I guess, year of career in sports for us. So I owe the university a great deal. Well, and, and we're grateful for you, the mentorship that you've provided students. Um, you know, we've had you come out to campus a couple times, and it's great to be able to walk you around campus again and get you involved. And And I know we've got students who are up in your neck of the woods in Oregon, and, and you've been such a great supporter of theirs. And so we just appreciate everything that you do. And, um, you know, I've left off quite a few significant things that you've done, um, recognition you've received. I mean, especially recently, it's the 40th anniversary or so of the the creation of the sports bra, right? Um, the original tech bra, you bet. Um, you know, that was, that was in the last couple of years. It seemed like there were quite a few publications that started coming out, um, recognizing uh, your part in that. Oh, 2017, right. Um, so you've been cited in, in countless publications, especially recently recognizing that achievement. And, and you know, just- Well, on, work- and on the research side, Mm-hmm. On the research side, because uh, our uh, research at Utah State University was really one of the foundational studies in sports bra science, not only very careful biomechanical work, but also a field study with 60 women about their complete experience with the sports bras. So I'm, my work is on ResearchGate. It's scarcely a week that goes by that my work is not either read or cited because it was a uh, foundational work. If you do any research on sports bras, your review of lit is going to cite the Utah State study. Well, I was going to say one of the things that if you search your name in USU, that research is the thing that pops up right at the top, right? And then under that is, you know, obviously everything else that you've done professionally and, and on the academic side. Um, so it, it really is incredible how foundational that was. And maybe we can get into that, that history a little bit. Um, so we're going to, you know, go back a little bit. I'm curious what led you to Utah State? And maybe if you can share your where you got your bachelor's degree, and then what led you to this decision to to come to Logan, Utah. Well, um, in terms of sports, Roz, I think uh, I've always been very active. I was in high school playing basketball, and we had girls' rules. We couldn't run full court uh, until we got a, had a PE teacher that let us do that. So, running, being physically active having a dad who was a teacher who was always very active out on the playground with his kids. I always loved sport very much. So when the running boom came, it was natural that I would be a part of that. And then starting to run distances beyond one mile, um, the issue of sports bras personally arose for me. Even you know, up to the time of the invention of the original jog bra in 1977 uh, by Lisa Lindahl, Hinda Miller, and uh, Polly Smith, I was constantly kind of refiguring, reworking my sports bras, taping things, trying to protect my body uh, by using a regular bra that I had altered. So the invention of the sports bra was a big deal for me. It was five years after Title IX sent many women and girls onto the court, onto the field with opportunities to play. So the timing was absolutely amazing. Now, uh, I did my uh, bachelor's degree in home economics, lots of sewing, tailoring, all of that. So I've had this lifelong, really lifelong uh, love of sewing and being able to create things. Interestingly enough, when I decided to go to Utah State, and I had been in uh, Logan with a friend of mine and, and actually had popped into the department a year or so before, I was interested in historic costume. 
I started my master's degree work in historic costumes, started a thesis on Logan knitting mills, which had become kind of a famous dressmaking entity. My main uh, person who had the knowledge died well into my research. I had to change to a second thesis topic, which was a consumer thesis topic. Um, long story short, my data got lost. So now I'm looking at a third research project. I was running at noon with a prof from the PE department and she and I talked about sports bras. Has anyone studied them? We found that there was a little bit of research, not very much. We wrote a grant uh, from the state of Utah, which funded this study. We didn't really, none of us had done biomechanical research. So there was a really steep learning curve. Finding 60 women um, in Logan, Utah, who would not only run on a treadmill in a sports bra, but also with just a, a sticker on the breast and having the, uh, the Institutional Research Board approve that. <laughs> but we did get funding, ordered in the cameras from Hollywood. It was old style, black and white, uh, 100 frames per second. Sent the film off, got it developed, didn't know if we had data, brought it back, hand digitized one frame at a time um, to, uh, to get our data. So it really was a, a very groundbreaking study that was not without pushback. <laughs> At that time, this was 1984-85. We also received the equivalent of the Proxmire Golden Fleece Award in the state of Utah for worst uh, use of state funds. <laughs> received interesting letters around that, but we knew that this was important that one of the things that makes it possible for women to lead an active, healthy lifestyle with all of the considerable emotional, mental, physical benefits, they need a great sports bra that uh, allows them to exercise without physical or emotional discomfort. Well, I, I'm glad that you, you shared a little bit of the opposition. Um, it, it seems like the 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 sports bra or the bra can not be seen as I, I don't know if you're if you're a man in the legislature right you you see that as not valuable research right, right? and and you're given that that yeah. award um for for not valuable right. research it's it's i hope we've come a lot further from there um you know we can have um but i i think it's it's really interesting i think your work um and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you, I feel like you've talked about the sports bra as equipment. You know, it's essential equipment yes. if you're going to participate in activity. Um, and equipment needs to be tested and studied. And, and it's, it's not mm -hmm. just a, a, a piece of fabric that you, that you put on, right? This is something that yeah. there's research and, and thought and effort that goes into creating something that's going to right. protect, right? And, and I think maybe there's some perception around that as well as just some 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 blatant sexism as well um that that has you know you know pushed against this idea but it, well uh, you know and that's exactly right and some of the input was like you just need to go to a high school track and watch and you know that breasts bounce so why do we need to right. study that but that's not the point of what i've been doing for 37 years what i've been doing all of these years and for many of those years uh for champion athletic wear is to understand what do we do with that support? How can we make that support effective, comfortable, modest, uh, a good fit on women? So the research is all about solutions that respect every level of sport, every size of body. I work uh, with uh, body sizes up to 4X, which I, I absolutely love my work with, with plus size women, and all of the uh, connection with women to understand what their needs are and to be constantly elevating that sports bra experience. The goal is you don't know that you have it on, it's just doing what it needs to do. And there's a tremendous uh, amount of research in material science, biomechanics. Now labs around the world are describing in detail the interaction between the breasts and the bra. Um, I don't do that, that sort of research anymore. All of mine is uh, based on consumer products. But there is so much to know about how to make a better bra, just like with a running shoe. Yes, we know that there's ground reaction forces with running, but look at the millions, maybe billions of dollars at this point that have been spent to understand how to make a better running shoe for every uh, type of athlete in person. 
Well, I, I, I love that you compare it to a running shoe, right? It, it's equipment. And, and is that something that you still feel like you have to fight in a way is, is make a case that this isn't just a fashion item, right? This, this is a piece of equipment. Maybe, maybe you don't have to make that case with women, but you know, uh, with, with oh, brands. Ironically, ironically, more than ever. Hmm. Um, back uh, a few years ago when Victoria's Secret got into the sports bra market, started making padded sports bras, athletic wear became fashionable then the requirement for it to be fashionable and increasingly fashionable, a lot of that has uh, ironically come from female consumers. Mm. So to go out in the marketplace right now, there are many things that look like sports bras or look like rather ridiculous sports bras that, don't, that aren't actually wearable from the point of view of providing support, comfort, fit, durability. So there's been a broadening of what appears to be a sports bra, which I think makes it all the more confusing if a woman is really going out trying to find a product that will work at a high level of intense exercise or comfort, uh, whether it's her Zumba class, uh, hot yoga, whatever it is. So right. it's a more confusing market. Well, speaking of confusing, right, and confusing, it's interesting to me that you mentioned, you know, different types of sports bras for different uses, right? It's just like you would a, a, a shoe, right? You're not going to use a road shoe on the trail or vice yeah. versa, right? Um, maybe we can go back a little bit further to clarify some terms, right, uh, for the audience. Um, you know, the jog, jog bra versus sports bra, right? What, what, what were the primary differences, you know, from your findings, you were building on work that had been done before you, but, but what had been done up, up to that point? Well, again, with 1972 and Title IX women becoming more active, that created a need. So women like me were looking around, what's there? That's what really drove the inventors of the original jog bra. They were active, their quote, everyday bras just weren't working. Uh, they tried a bunch of different things to try to come up with a bra that would work. And um, one of the things I have here on my desk, I, I use a lot of my presentations. This is a jock strap, which probably most guys don't even know what it is now. They literally, uh, one of their husbands says, you need a jock strap for the breast. They literally deconstructed two and came up with a prototype, which uh, very much resembles their first commercial product, which uh, answered the needs of active women. No, uh, a nice, wide, stretchy, comfortable uh, band, no hardware, uh, cups that compress rather than going into uh, two separate cups, straps that were crossed in the back so they couldn't fall off the shoulders. Um, you know, the DNA of every modern racerback sports bra is uh, in that prototype. So it was, and I often do this in my industrial design work, it's like sometimes I have a problem to be solved and you look every single direction and sometimes it's just almost like pure serendipity, but okay, a jock strap was meant to hold something comfortably close to the body. And so uh, taking that inspiration into a product that solved the, need, the, the problems that women had in sport was, was lucky genius. Uh, the inventors uh, who are good friends of mine still after all these years would definitely say that. Who, who were the makers of, so was there commercial jog bras that were on the market at, when these initial inventors created it? You know, this, uh, and it? the patent on the, on the original jog bra, which looked a little bit more like this one, mm. um, and is in, uh, in design museums, things like that. Uh, there was a company, jog bra, uh, JBI formed, mm. Linda Miller, Lisa Lindahl, and Polly Smith were the three women who created that design. Lisa and Hinda went on to run the jog bra company uh, for uh, a number of years. I first met them in 19, actually in 1984 when they sent product out for our Utah State study. Hmm. Uh, I have a great photo of me holding up all of these bras on my arm and the original jog mm -hmm. bra just happened to be in front. I didn't know I would have uh, decades of consulting for that company later. Um, and then at some point they were acquired by Playtex, acquired by Sara Lee Corporation, spun off as part of Haynes Brands. And so through the years, uh, I've, I've been with the brand. It's been interesting to see it grow from the little headquarters on, uh, on the river there in Burlington, Vermont. 
right? And so I guess the interesting distinction for me is the jog bra was created, but but not there wasn't necessarily academic research and testing. What was there academic no. research or <laughs> testing involved? There wasn't, right? No, no, there was. There was one sports bra in the Utah State study, the Lady Duke, that claimed to have some research behind it. It was very supportive, but otherwise not wearable, really. <laughs> um, so when I, when I did my Utah State study, I reached out to every brand that had something on the market, positioned as a sports bra. And this was seven years after the founding of Jog Bra. And uh, I got products in that were so crazy that... Um, there's no way I can include them in the study. So there was a lot of things out there posing as a sports bra by 1984. I tried to pick a really representative sample of different styles, different ways of, of designing a bra, controlling breast motion. And, uh, and that's kind of what set the uh, parameters of my study. Right. So with that, what, what were you looking for? I know you were testing, um, you know, and measuring a lot. What, what yeah. what what was the outcome that you were kind of looking for? What was the outcome that resulted from all of all of your research? My goal, and which is always still my goal, and I I run two major projects here a year for Champion, where we bring in the the new releases from every brand, um, is to understand not only kind of you know yes the breasts are moving and yes a bra can control motion by this much, but to understand. How is it that we build a bra that makes it support better, fit better, be more uh, fit better over a range of body, be more comfortable, and uh, satisfy all the design parameters that women are looking for in a sports bra? Um, so, uh, I mean, I had, uh, you know, from another brand, this study I just completed, the designers decided the lower part of the racerback strap to put it way out to the side. I have a wear tester who's an elite marathon around the Olympic trials. She had it on and she said, you know, this is really shallow of me, but this strap thing right here, it gives me back fat and I'm very lean and mm -hmm. I would never, <laughs> never wear this bra. And so that's, you know, my understanding of strap placement and the problems that it can either solve or create. So for me, it's always been about understanding the functionality the appearance, uh, everything with the bra. And all of those things are important. I get ratings with my wear testers on perceived support, perceived comfort, uh, fit on their body, how much they like the style. And it does, does it provide the modest uh, to the breast area and not calling attention to themselves that they want. So it's very difficult to meet all five of those factors. The goal of my research is to really push all of those levers forward. So and based, based off of your research, your goal, uh, was your goal from the beginning to, to, to sew up your own creation, to create a new product? Or is that something no, that you not, figured out as you, were, as you were researching, you started to recognize there's something missing here that I could, I could fill in the yeah. gap? I think it was, you know, understanding. That was, for me personally, <clears throat> as an athlete and for all women, um, so at Utah State, I finished my master's. I was going to go. I, what I realized is I needed to understand all I could about how the body moves, how it works, how it heats and cools itself in order to do the kind of research on athletic clothing I was interested in. I was set to, to go straight on to Oregon State. I did, uh, they did call me to University of Nevada to teach apparel design a couple of years. But then I went on with the same goal of understanding what is that interaction between the body and the things that we wear in sport. And uh, so early on, you know, from 1987 on, consulting for Champion, uh, I've always had my, my hand, uh, the opportunity to have my hand on design and building better bras. Uh, you know, it's amazing that for more than 30 years, twice a year, Champion has sponsored research to help me understand that and for me to gain that sort of expertise. So I, you know, I, I've been, it, it's kind of been like having my own company from the point of view of having a lot of influence on what gets done. Um, but um, I never really felt like I want to, I want to have a startup sports rock company. I was able to, I was never felt like I met my limit, uh, lim any limitations by being a contractor for champion. Yeah. So do you feel like that 
the, the modern sports bra, right? That next iteration, you know, post jog bra, what was that? Was that possible through, you know, obviously your research and your expertise and then having a company like champion come and help support that? Is that where the kind of modern sports bra was, was really created was through that work with champion? Well, you know, uh, I have to say there are a lot of uh, brands, companies, large and small, who have engaged in the effort to build great sports bras. We've all had our hits and our misses. I love the fact that there are a lot of different brands out there. It's kind of like with athletic shoes. Each company has sort of a different last, a different approach to fit. We're all diverse. So if we only had one brand of jeans or athletic shoes or sports bras, that would be difficult. And I think the companies challenge each other uh, to try new things and do different things. Now, that said, um, I see a lot of technology uh, coming through my lab from other brands, uh, I would say more so than Champion, where the technology has kind of been the end all of the whole design process and it doesn't always work, it introduces other problems. Uh, a bra is a very personal item for women and if it starts looking too different or acting, feeling too different from what they're used to, generally, you know, it's just like, yeah, I don't think so. So um, thinking back to those five levers, again, of support, comfort, fit, et cetera, you can solve one problem with the new technology, but it may introduce another problem that was unforeseen. So I have a, um, I think, I love technology. I don't see it as the end all. I think that we will have more progressively, more technology. I see some of our issues with sports bras are more around fit. I mean, this is the, the breast, the front of a woman's chest is a very convoluted topology and we're all very different. Um, so I see a future which is more probably engaged with new ways of providing personalized fit both in the shopping experience and in constructing the bra than necessarily just um, new materials. It's tough with a shoe. You're always gonna have a sock. You can always have a sock between your foot and the shoe. Uh, with a sports bra, it fits next to the skin. So the inside of the sports bra, there are real constraints on the materials you can put there, the kind of stitching, the things you might wanna do that are going to that may create abrasion and, and make the bra unwearable. So it's, you know, it's, I, I have said many times to my team and to the media, there's no piece of apparel more difficult to design well than a sports bra. And right. I, I stand on that. And of course I had to pick that as uh, my life work. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so, you know, after your, your, um, your studies at, at uh, Oregon state, um, that led you to working with champion. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, what 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 were what were some of those early days like there? What what kinds of efforts were you engaged in? Was it a continuation kind of of your research? Like you were just you just had access to more resources and more opportunity. What what was some of that yeah. time like? And uh, and that's when I uh, began to enter into the design process and work with the great designers at Jogbra at that time. And this was such a new industry, and even our sports bra designers had no background in designing sports bras, but designing some of the greatest innovations that we've seen in sports bras and are still doing good work. So we were all kind of finding our way. And the upside of that was it's, there was not, well, let's not try this because it's not what a sports bra should be and look like. There was this, we are uh, creating this, we are inventing, we're building every year on what we've learned. And so rather than just doing the research and and testing, uh, I became uh, greatly involved in the whole design process and having the ability to test our uh, prototypes very early to make changes. Um, I, you know, I felt really uh, like I was within the company, as I have most of the time in my consulting with Champion, um, that I'm, I'm really more uh, a partner. I'm not a contractor. <laughs> what well, do you do you have some of that that early product? I guess. Do you remember that moment, you know, launching your first commercial product? Oh wow! Um, well, some of the products that I was super involved in the development of had to do with innovation, like low friction fibers that would cut chafing. Um, we did the first sort of shaper bra with a spacer fabric, the first in the industry. Um, so there, you know, there were just a number of things that I was a member of the team that brought those 
to market. And uh, with my wear testing group here in Portland, Oregon, you know, get them on, on bodies right away, which is something I, I continue to this, you know, to this day I get, you know, I just had a box in from, you know, Vietnam and uh, a new vendor and a new style and putting on our body, this is what works, what doesn't work, this is how we need to tweak the fit. Uh, I think what has really brought value to the brand is as a scientist, as, as an apparel designer, as a, as a business, having a, a also vast marketing business background, if I see something on a bra, I integrate all of those aspects. I can see something and I, with tech design, I can say, this is what I saw to correct it. This is how you need to adjust the line on that pattern piece. So I have that expertise. I can see something that from a market point of view, I just don't see how it's going to work. I can see some benefit to a new style and work with the marketing team. This is, you know, this is a call out we should make for this style. So uh, wearing all of those different hats over a long period of time um, is, is, is a lot of my value. Um, you know, Jen has often said, we need to replace you with about four people because you wear, you know, those multiple hats, <laughs> right. but which, which I enjoy very much. Yeah. It keeps uh, it live. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Never a dull moment. I imagine. Um, what, um, I guess, what are some of the highlights over your time? You, you've been work, you've had relationships with, with these large brands for a long time. Yeah. I'd have been consulting with them. Um, a lot has changed as well, you know, in, in the world, sure. you know, in, in this industry, what have been some of the highlights, um, you know, working professionally to, to make better, better product? You know, I, the number one thing for me has been the opportunity to personally work with thousands of women, trying on product, meeting them at, you know, like Susan Coleman races, run Disney events that I represented champion with, hearing their stories, seeing the scars on their body, uh, knowing the, uh, the intensity of their love for sport. And when they find a bra that really works, more recently working with plus size women, it's just like without a bra in my size, I mean, Chase, imagine how many miles would you run if there were no shoes you could get right. your foot into. Uh, so the women I've, uh, I've been able to work with and meet and who have educated and informed me, well, that's just really at the top of, of my list of, of, I don't know, I'll call it a blessing. Uh, and a source of my professional growth has been input from real women who will give their, they're out there kicking it hard and they'll give their honest opinions. Uh, the opportunity to work with a, a company like Champion that uh, for about 35 years now has twice a year sponsored major research projects and sponsored my ability to study and learn. There's just no other, there's no other brand that, that has done that. A lot of brands are, are more recently uh, doing research, but you know, the, for me, uh, when I look at a brand who has consistently invested in, in women and women's experience with sport uh, and has just given me the opportunity to learn so much, um, that, that's a real big thing for me. Um, and, you know, there's, there's groups that we've worked with, like the U.S. Women's Volleyball Team uh, product for them, the opportunity to meet them and their coaches. Um, the opportunity after I, I've had this experience to do things like the 30 for 30 ESPN piece on sports bras and a lot of media opportunities where I've met amazing people as well. I have a network of, of friendships uh, that have nothing to do with interviews at this point. We're just women still finding our way and pushing the envelope um, in the world of, of women's sports and uh, women's sports equipment like a bra. I guess I'm still surprised to a degree that there's not more companies that are really taking the equipment side of this um, more seriously. And, and maybe it goes back to what you said, this, this, you know, athleisure, right. Becoming the dominant force. Um, it, it seems like, and, and that focus on, on the aesthetic versus the performance sure. is kind of overtaking everything. Um, it, it, do you feel like that's kind of the main um, the main barrier, the main resistance to more companies, you know, really taking seriously this idea of, of a sports bras equipment? Well, you know, uh, it's, 
if you have the luxury of selling millions of sports bras a year based on a new strappy back or something that's cute or whatever, I mean, it's, it's I understand if, if you're hitting your mark sales wise in sports bras as a company, that there would be that temptation to, you know, why do we, why do we need to uh, go to the lab? Um, and, and that's, you know, and I've had opportunities to consult for many companies who want me to come in for, you know, maybe six months or so. Uh, with Champion, it's part of the DNA of our sports bra. Research is central to that. And regardless of how many bras we're selling, there's that commitment to understanding women's bodies and their interaction with their sports bras, materials, what works and doesn't work. And that to me is, uh, it's really satisfying work. Uh, to know that it's not just about sales, it's not just about cuteness. Um, and I mean, there's nothing wrong with, with cute sports bras. And we all do activities that are low impact, medium, high impact. So not every sports bra needs to just, you know, strap you down. Uh, so I, you know, so I do understand um, why maybe it's not necessary for me personally and the difference I want to make in the world. I'm just really grateful that I've had such a super partner that is so deeply committed to the research that we do. Right. That that's incredible to have have such you know a company with such a reputation committed to this. Um, I I'm interested. I I, I listened to a podcast recently. It's ninety ninety nine percent invisible, um, and they were really talking about um, product kind of our, the built environment around us, um, so much of, of life is built and designed by men. And in a lot of ways, from that perspective, right? Um, and in a lot of ways, not taking it into account um, women into that equation, right? Um, to, to, the, to the degree that he, like even um, seatbelt design, right? Is, is largely designed by men, Right. And, and car design right. and, and where the seat is positioned in the car and, 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 every, you know, all the sizes and everything. Yeah. Um, it's, it's designed yeah. um, f from one perspective. Right. And to take into account, you know, largely an average size body of, of a man. Right. Um, right. I, I, I this, this is the world that, that you're operating in, in a way. Right. And, and, and in, in a lot of, like a lot of products are designed that way, unfortunately, right? In, in footwear, it seems like more recently you're seeing footwear that's designed for, um, for a woman's foot, right? And product that is, is designed for women, right? Rather than let's take uh, uh, the design for men and just shrink it, right? The shrink it and pink it is, is, is a terrible, terrible idea um, and a terrible concept, but um, what are your perspectives and thoughts on that? And, and do you see companies that are doing a, a better job of, of actually listening and designing product for women? You know, um, that is such a great question. And it harks back to when I, I did my first seminar there at Utah State for OPDD. And after my presentation, one of the first questions from a, a, a young man in the front row was, do you think that a man can design a great sports bra for women? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and what a great question that was. And so I kind of look at it at two ways. Uh, because the industry and a lot of the activities have been male dominated, the size of the female market was, you know, literally and figuratively smaller. And so um, there was not as much motivation, I think, to sell to them other than, you know, shrinking and pinking. That certainly has has changed a great deal. Um, but the other part of that is, and what I love so much about the OPDD program, is that as a designer, you should never be limited to your own experiences. You should have such a robust, rigorous design process in your head and reaching out to whoever the end user is, getting into their head, into their life, and, and understanding that intimately, that regardless of your gender, if you really are uh, a well-grounded, well-trained designer with a design process that is effective, you don't have to be designing for yourself, whether it's gender, sport, whatever. Now, it may give you more passion if you're designing ski wear and you're an avid skier. I understand that. That passion is what drove me a lot with sports bras. 
But on the other hand, we never really design for ourselves. We understand who the end user is, what the market is, what are their stories, and how our product affects, changes, elevates their stories. Uh, but it, you know, but there's definitely taken, um, there's definitely had to be uh, pressure applied. Certainly in my experience, uh, there was a point when I was uh, not exclusive to Champion where I did uh, some sports bar research for a major brand. We ran a research project through their sport research lab. Great opposition. And uh, the female researchers from that company wrote a paper along with me, a scientific paper, had it accepted, but their travel to present was not paid, even though the male researchers from that sport mm. research lab it was paid. So, you know, over the period of time, I, you know, I, I've been able to identify areas where we need to work harder, certainly um, starting from my, you know, my first research at Utah State on out. <laughs> Well, it just seems like, uh, you know, this, this whole story, this whole experience is in some ways defined by barriers coming down, right? Title IX coming into effect, you know, providing opportunity for more yeah. women to, to participate in sport. Yes. Um, I imagine, um, you know, you have that first jog bra that is really just taken from existing, um, um, you know, existing product that, that in the world already, um, barriers to entry when it comes to materials, right? And I imagine that's something that you're working on a lot, um, breaking that down to, to increase comfort and, and provide a better experience. Um, it seems like another barrier that you're really tackling right now is, is more inclusive design, right, of, of sports okay. bras, providing a variety of sizes, a variety of fits. Uh, and I, I'm curious from your perspective, is this the direction that you see more products going? Do you see more product, you know, more brands, um, you know, needing to think more consciously about who they're designing for, you know, for the longest time, it's small, medium, large, right? N not all of us fit Absolutely. into that very strict definition, right? Um, is, is that the direction we're going is more customization, more personalization, more, um, yeah. you know, better, better fitting product. Well, and, and, you know, and a major reality check. I mean, when we look at, at, let's just take the U.S. as a population where we have, you know, 70, 75% of people are either overweight or obese. And if you're only designing up to the low end of overweight, that's tremendous white space that you're turning your back on. And these are people that are active that uh, want to do many of the same things. I had my, uh, just a couple of days ago, my very first plus wear tester it took me a long time to persuade a woman with a larger body size to come to the lab where she would have to be just in her sports bra. And so all of what social society might say our body imperfections would be on display. Through her work with me, she's gone on to do um, modeling for other companies. She's seen that sort of, that sort of confidence. But this is a, a young woman um, who, um, a little taller than me, probably weighs, uh, you know, 100 pounds more, runs half marathons, active and, and, and absolutely amazing. And, you know, there are health implications with obesity and things like that, but I can tell you, it's not an easy problem to solve in our society. But I, but I will tell you that it's not helped if a sports brand says, we're just gonna turn our backs on you and pretend you don't exist. So that's the leverage that any athletic brand has is inclusivity in the sizing of their products, in their advertising, reaching out and helping every person to pursue a, a healthier, more active lifestyle. Right, I love that, that's powerful. Um, we didn't even talk about the bra lab. Um, that you're sitting in right now. Uh, I'm sitting how, in right now. You bet. How, how long have you? How long have you had your own space to operate um, and conduct this research? And and how long have you been functioning your own? You know, you're operating your own bra lab. Uh, more than six years, hmm. and it has uh, opened the door not just to doing my regular big projects, but to doing much more early stage R and D for Champion uh, to test. Uh, first, uh, you know, first uh, prototype products that came in. When I was in uh, New York, my last travel, first week in February, there was a product under development and I had tested it just before, for example, just before I came out, we talked about it and we talked about it needing more stabilization in the strap. I was able to 
add that in my studio, uh, let's do three and a half inches of stabilization test, four and a half test, five and a half, and determine how much stabilization we needed and what was effective. So, ha you know, having at the ready those kinds of uh, hard data results for our design team is, is just really amazing. I can do anything on short notice. So uh, I mean, we've had such an amazing long relationship with Oregon State University for, for a very long time, uh, but having uh, our own lab here, which is the only 100% sports bra uh, dedicated biomechanics lab in the country has just been amazing for me. Uh, through the software I have with my Bicon system and the Nexus software and then add-on software that I've developed, I can literally run a trial, push a few buttons and, and uh, you know, in half a minute, tell you how many centimeters the breast is moving relative to the body in that bra. So it's, yeah, it's, I, I still get kind of goosebumpy about what, even after six years. That's incredible. Um, what, 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 I guess, what does the day-to-day -day look like, you know, when you're testing, um, you know, what does that process look like? Someone comes in, um, do, do you have individuals who come in, you know, do you, do you take clients like that? Or is it primarily just the work that you're doing with, with brands? And you um, need, I'm exclusive you know. to Champion, but with Champion, we test everything that's out there. Okay. Uh, but I have uh, about 200 wear testers in my database here in Portland, Oregon. And depending on what I need, um, if I'm, it's a major project or if it's a small project, I'll reach out, uh, a wear tester will come in, I'll do her measurements, I'll give her a stack of bras, instrument her up with the reflective markers, and she will run trials on the treadmill. I clock data with the cameras. Um, and then I, for each trial, I also get that uh, perceptual input on support, comfort, fit, style, and modesty. So um, that's one thing I do. I also do focus groups on a particular topic. It might be straps and backs. Do you like padding versus no padding? And uh, so I, I add to the consumer insight research that the Champion brand does in a way that's very specific to sports bras and to specific design details of sports bras. So it, it really uh, gives our design and marketing and merchandising teams um, more, uh, more relevant information. Anytime you launch a new product, especially, you're always jumping off the cliff. And I always say, you know, but if you can come to the edge of the cliff with a little more data, maybe there's a ledge there to jump onto rather than just rushing off, having that extra um, amount of pre-launch data is really valuable. Wow. Well, I don't want to take too much of your time. I, I know you've, you've got things to do, um, but w what excites you about the future um, of, of this product? You know, the work that you're doing, what, what, what gets you up every day um, continuing this work? And, and I guess what, what just excites you about the future of what's coming? Yeah. You know, the one thing that excites me every single day is I believe that every woman should be able to enjoy the considerable physical, mental, emotional, even spiritual benefits of exercise. And she needs a great sports bra to do that. And uh, for me to have not only the ability to be part of that process of bringing sports bras always forward through uh, careful research, um, and actually get paid for it, <laughs> which is amazing. Um, I mean, it's it's like it's like my meaning and purpose. Uh, and as I as I said earlier, the number one thing that has been so amazing over the years is my one on one interaction with my wear testers. They inspire me. Um, I tell you, it's uh, everyone should have that goodness in their life. I'm very grateful. Well, your the passion that you have for this is is infectious. Uh, it's just uh, it's it's amazing, uh, and your optimism for the future. Um, you know, I I always love to be able to talk to you and hear hear what you're excited about, what you're working on, um, and I know our listeners listeners will love that as well. So I appreciate you taking time to to share what you're working on um, and the the history of gear that you're a part of, right? And um, I wanted to emphasize, you know sports bras as a piece of gear and and it's a part of this larger history of, of our industry developing and growing um if people want to stay in touch with you and, and hear about what you're working on what how how do people stay in touch with you 
my best uh, my best point of connection is LinkedIn. Just uh, look for me on LinkedIn, LaJean Lawson, and uh, happy to connect. I love all the connections with current and former students from the OPDD program. I'm delighted to hear uh, uh, recently that one is coming out for the U of O uh, MBA in Sports Product Management, where I yeah. also uh, guest lecture frequently. So uh, I'm really happy to be the uh, Utah State Outpost here for OPDD. You're, including... you're our satellite office. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, I, I appreciate you and everything that you do and, and your willingness to support um, all our students and, and, and everything that you do. So thanks for taking time. Um, and it's always good to talk to you. Great to talk to you too. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me and good luck to all of you. Mm -hmm.